I know we've covered this before. The question of mass drawing and line drawing, I think, is, you know, and I hope all you who are fresh to the game here, to the <laughs> 400 videos or so, uh, do look through the title as best you can and uh, review what we've already done. So, you know, because a lot of times these are covered and we're trying to cover them with titles. So this one has mass, it says mass and line, or maybe unless <laughs> as Mr. Producer changed it. Um, before I go any farther, uh, by the way, I want uh, to remind you, um, Mr. Producer has been asking me to s let you know that I'm trying to do a, a workshop in London <clears throat> late in the year, or not particularly late, maybe late in the fall would be a better way to say it. It's still in the works, still a discussion point, but I'm supposed to be reminding you from time to time. Uh, so for our European friends who can get over there, um, yeah, I mean to do something in person. So that would be something you'd enjoy. Uh, stay tuned, okay? Uh, the um, I want to give a thanks to Jimmy C., Benjamin C., and Adam C. for those three three uh, recurring donations. Uh, thank you for keeping up, guys. <laughs> Keep on encouraging me, and uh, I hope your own work is uh, benefiting and everything that we uh, produce out there for you. All right. So thank you, guys. Let me look at, uh, let's look at um, the, um, and I'm coming back to mass drawing, and I know we've been in some version of it or another before, but if you guys ask the question, I'm going to probably talk about it if I can think of a way of refining it or narrowing it down in more focused ways, you know. Uh, so now part of this, you know, my mission in uh, doing these is to be an exponent of what I call the Boston School of Thinking, which is different from Paxton and Gamble uh, in that in that academic model that they uh, represent. So whatever I'm doing is <clears throat> going to be trying to bounce off of that and feed into that and educate you about that. <laughs> uh, so uh, and so that's just the way it is. But um, but I cover other territory. Because we all come from the whole field of painting, right? The whole world of the painting, no matter what, no matter what era, what time, what, who. <laughs> so let's read. Um, this is Kawaz, and uh, these are, by the way, these kinds of names. They are the names I find you are sending me. You, uh, you, it's your handle, your email handle, whatever that is. But he says he she says I find mass drawing a great way to capture a composition's rhythm and soul quickly. I feel like in painting. Uh, it's meant to be a sort of economic way to consolidate that instead of rendering things painstakingly, like Bouguereau does flesh and often drapery. His backgrounds, however, are easy to digest uh, mass drawings for the most part, rest areas. I definitely want to see mass drawing covered more often if possible. Well, this is a don't throw me in the briar patch moment because the Boston School's basic tenet is mass drawing. Now I'll separate that from Gamel and from uh, and from uh, uh, Paxton because there's an element of concern and focus on outline as a priority, and so I'm just going to walk you through pictures because it's all up here very straightforwardly, and uh, we're just going to be talking about <clears throat> uh, various ways to think about mass drawing. Mass drawing is <laughs> mass drawing, mass painting. Um, you know, I I. <laughs> These words, you know, and the, the, the world we're in is just full of these words, you know, that, that can be so problematical. And I'm trying to always use, look for a useful, uh, you know, why would we say mass drawing versus line drawing? Or in painting, would we say line painting? Well, I talk about the painting from outlines, and Degas even describes drawing as, as what happens between the contours. Well, that's in the class of you create the contour and you model it up, right? So that in the, is in a sense. Now, that's what we're talking about, one thing. And that's what Bouguereau does. That's what Leighton does. You're gonna, I'm going to show you images. And uh, But then this other thing called mass drawing. Just notice what it is. And I'll try to, as the images come up, I'll try to talk about it as we think about it. Um, you know, and I would argue that almost anything <laughs> except line-based painting is mass painting. <laughs> But, um, and the Boston School is an interesting mix. You put down blobs and you articulate what happens at joints. So you could call that a line, but it's never done as a line. 
So if you say line and mean line as opposed to mean outline, the silhouette, the God's argument is the silhouette is the thing, and that's way closer to the Boston School thinking is. But the silhouette doesn't imply a full outline. And you'll see very good examples of both of those. Uh, the full outline one is fairly common in um, earlier work. Um, it's unusual for people to lose uh, in a methodology, in a methodological way, you know, is that part of their process to, to work from lost and found early in, 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 since the Renaissance, before. Most people are working from outlines. They draw out, outlines and they make their images, but they make outlines because they're making figures and they don't want to lose their figures. So. But anyway, let's just start with Leonardo. He is noticeably linear, right? He uses line a lot, fine lines, uh, silver point most frequently, I guess. But these are two sweet examples of uh, the quality of this work. But So you'll notice that the modeling in the face up there, even though it's there, isn't mass modeled. It's gotten to the masses, but it's done by line. Now, if you say that he's not massing on some level, he is, but it's not mass driven, it's line driven, and the line stays and shows and all that sort of thing. So in that sense, it's, and this is just the drawing portion of what I'm talking about. But you can see how everything he's doing is drawing the outline of a leg, the outline of a horse, a leg, a human leg, a horse's leg, whatever. That's self-evident, isn't it? And we have everybody knows Ang and the, and, the, and the fine point he uses with the, of, of graphite. This is all outline painting. It's not driven by high, um, by, by the values content even. The values content is just there to get the form to really show. But the outline is the thing. Study, you know, draw lines, my son, lots of lines from memory and from nature, right? Degas quoting Ang. So this is Paxton to give you a more clear example of the thinking that goes into the, the in a drawing, Paxton's approach to drawing. <clears throat> very Angian, right? Very much an outline. These are, these are some very nice drawings. I've seen some even nicer ones, and it's hard to say. That one on the left is really quite a, a remarkable thing. Um, but that's, that's outline-based drawing, but you can see he's actually pushing the values considerably more but it's not based on something I'd call chiaroscuro, which would be more in the class of what you would call mass, mass drawing. So here's some curious combination. He's probably using a point throughout, maybe sticking his finger in it, but you can see yeah, you know, the line shows, and you could say that's just a convention in that spot. He's really trying to be a mass guy, right? So most of this is blobs, and what happens where they meet other value blobs, right? And it could have been done in grander, you know? But what I'll say to you, just to be clear, and I've been talking about this recently with uh, some of my students here, that is, there, there is a thing about when you're going to throw a blob in like this, uh, you're using a white piece of paper, it makes sense to throw some lines around for the purpose of just beginning to locate. And by the way, in, <laughs> that, this is particularly notice, uh, uh, useful with white paper that you can damage if you want to maintain the whiteness of the lightest tones and stuff in the skin. Uh, that, then using some preliminary lines that are fairly light is a, is a thing. But, but if you're working like I do, and, and I, uh, what, uh, uh, what Benson seems to be doing like here, and again, this is Boston School Benson, uh, you can see that the, whatever line he's got, there's a sort of a quick orientation to move the mass in relation to it. To, in other words, to articulate some sort of a bit of a shape and then bl throw the values into uh, and, and bury it in the values. Uh, but this can be done with your thumb with a fat charcoal that makes a wide or side of a charcoal. There's a lot of ways to do mass drawing per se, but this is drawing, as it were, from the mass, even though it's using line as part of it. So I'm saying this is a mixed one. This is, again, what I'm trying to tell you, is, or have you think about it, is how useful is your definition of mass drawing. Because I'm going to make it clearer and clearer by the second. Again, this one on the right is, is discussed as John Campbell's. I don't know whose term that was initially, but Gamble threw that at us. Um, and, uh, but you can see this is, an, this, this is a magnificent piece of line work, and I could show you so many others. We've talked about it. You can find it in other videos. But there's no attempt to hide the line or to reproduce the sense of light in the, in a, in this, in the same sense as a Benson is doing, right? And there's a difference in orientation. The mass guy wants to be into this pretty quick, you know, into the values per se, which means you're going to wind up with a light effect. This guy's just getting the, you know, getting the uh, a separation, you know, getting a little bit. You see, the line never goes away, and uh, you know, and even you know, he's drawing the hair, and it's all, you know, it's all about which lines are doing what. Leonardo does the same thing. Um, 
that you can see that he, no matter what he does in the hair, there's a tendency to want to go get into the get into the mass and the great form of it much more than the line aspect of it. Uh, but what's one of the fun experiences I had young was to discover in a show, I don't remember if it was The Fog or maybe it was The Met, uh, it's, a, it's in the States though, uh, of Leonardo's drawings. And one of them was the size of a postage stamp. I mean, literally like this big, the one on the left. And this is the only reproduction I could find of it um, within my time frame. But you can see the difference right here between line drawing, this is drawing outlines of every single branch and all that sort of stuff, and blob drawing, right? This is drawing by the blob. So in this sense, you see, he, he's already ahead of Velasquez, and he's very much into a place. Now, all painters with paint in their hand might do that in a sketch modality, meaning to get the essence of a thing up pretty quickly. But it's just a really interesting example of, uh, of uh, the, the, the two ends of the spectrum, if you want to put it that way, out of one, out of one painter. So don't limit yourself. Now this is really quintessential. The, um, and I apologize, but I, I'm really out of time, but I apologize for not putting names of artists on all these. But these are, I, I think these are both Japanese. It's possible the one that is Chinese, but I don't honestly know. Um, but you can see one's a landscape, and this is this is painting literally by the blob. This is this is, and it's ink. Sumiai or what, whatever, I don't know what all these, the terminology is, but you can see that this is being done entirely like watercolor frequently is by washes, which are done with a fairly fat, soft brush. And, and it's done as a mark, you know, it's full of information. So there's a lot you're trying to say with a single mark and get out. But that, this is what I would call pure mass drawing. If you want to talk about mass drawing or even mass painting, it's easy to understand it. It's fairly monochromatic usually, sometimes more so. But um, you can see that it's got this awareness of edge and lost and found. These are very much characteristics or things that are in the image in front of you that would make you even want to paint with a fat brush, right? Larger masses of darks on light or, or big sweeping abstractions of uh, like washes of middle tones. So let's see if we can, now what do I do? This is now I'm moving, uh, I'm gonna go right through this whole thing again with paintings. So just before, bear with me here a little bit, but what I'm showing you now is what I do with students. I try to take, I have them take just, just wrapping paper, you know, whatever, I don't know what you call it, craft paper. <laughs> and what they're doing here is, and these are just a bunch of different students. And what they're doing here is they're drawing from the mass. Now, I, I, they can, there's nothing stopping them from throwing lines down. I have them go through two different exercises where they'll do blobs. First, value, spot some values around, and then start searching out the location of the, and, and, and meaning, set out the lightest light and the darkest dark as you would in a painting. And then, so those are blobs. And then you go and bring those together to make joints. Um, so, and I, this may, I think this might have been a demonstration that I did, but in that case, I was using some combination of, of line, you know, setting a tentative note out there and then immediately turn it into a mass, lose the line. But this gives you some images. So you can see the difference between line drawing and mass drawing in the sense that the full value is what you would be winding up with. So now this is, <laughs> you're talking about Vermeer and Velasquez. Now these are two central figures in the Boston School's um, pantheon of, you know, <laughs> you know, painterly wonders, uh, people to admire the light and, um, and uh, color of, uh, of uh, Vermeer in particular, and the, uh, and the visual order, visual impression in the sense of, uh, of what shall we say, accommodating, um, I, I like to say visual order because there's this huge amount of lost and found. You can find some relative lostness in, uh, for sure, in, uh, in Vermeer, but he doesn't, appear to paint from it as much as uh, as um, Velasquez does. But this would be just, if you just look at them, you should be able to plainly see the difference. You can see a fat, fatter, wet brush involved in this kind of marking. And you, so some people would refer to it, I think Hale did at one point, as drawing by the blob. 
So this spot between the fingers, he didn't draw a bunch of fingers and then start putting modeling in. He actually drew that unit of value. You know, he possibly drew this large white thing first, like a watercolorist might, and then perhaps did some a, a articulate line around setting it up as a contour and then subdividing it eventually at some point with another stroke of a middle tone value that uh, he would then use to draw uh, as he as he went, you know. I hope that's a bit you can grasp, but um, this is so like the Boston School thinking. And it's also, as I've said to you many times before, there's so much what's happening in this grand shift. Uh, both these guys are spectacular painters uh, and are highly worthy of emulation, but you can see where I'm going with this now. So you see the, I showed you some Chinese, Japanese before, but the one on the left is, is as you might call, pure cutout, outline-based, flat forms and outline-based. <laughs> now you don't have to have flat forms to be outline-based, but you can see the difference. Again, these, this is, Hol Holbein is a marvel of that, but you can see his drawings are all like perfect tracings. So it is clear that he just filled in, found those lines, perhaps like Bouguereau, traced them onto the canvas and then just filled in the big masses and then modeled up what was inside them. And it's an approach that's common to this way of working. You, you might have done your entire drawing first. In the case of Velasquez, those last ones, that's more questionable. And um, in the case of the Boston School, it's, it's, there's very little of that in the same. It, it's all over the place a little bit, though, you might say. I mean, you think of a guy like Carol Strand as a mass draftsman, but he's doing a whole bunch of drawing, they say. Uh, you know, the information about a Will Lowe uh, chronicle of friendships or something like that is, uh, is the place to read about um, um, what Carol Strand was doing with his, you know, based on his understanding, to some degree, I guess the word understanding is right, of Velasquez or his influence. But you can see, you can see the patterny cutoutness of all three of these, can't you? So then, uh, and there, actually, <laughs> no, I showed that twice. This, but this is sort of, the, in some sense, it's model, you know, and, and even Ang suggests looking at these things. I think he's looking at it because he's wanting you to engage the idea of fascinating abstractions and what happens in the pattern itself. You know, is that an amusing abstraction in that circle? And, uh, you know, the, 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 the interplay of all the elements um, but it's essentially the same. You can see there's a, an element of just pure flatness about it. It's outline based, but all the stuff that it gives you when you're in that world, you know, there's, it's striking frequently. It's very striking. And I think Leighton may be as good an example of anybody. I don't show him here. Uh, but it's very striking in, its, in the beauty of its, of its um, uh, you know, its outlines. I mean, you know, in some simple sense, the outline of its objects. I've always favored this one, by the way, by Holbein, so... Sweet piece of painting. You know, you're sitting there thinking, I don't really want to paint like that, but there's something about it. Some of his work really goes right to the sky. And, uh, and there are those too. This isn't. But now again, Bougro, this is where you can see full modeling in this Bougro on the left, but it's still, you can see it's, a, it's still a painting of a series of objects based on the outline of each part. So that's just the way it is, right? That's why this looks that way down here, right? There's no lost and found or any of that stuff except by after the fact, you know. Um, yeah, at one point I was talking to Gamble about some of those kinds of edges, and he says, oh, you can, you can lose that later. Well, that's not exactly, it, methodologically, that's exactly opposite of what Boston School people do. Now, the one on the right is Flandrin, and that's a mural, and that's very common to murals to be essentially flat. You know, in other words, uh, to try to not stick out of the wall, to not go deep in space, and to not, you know, you know, it's about maintaining the wall and, and the, uh, <clears throat> you know, in a sense, I guess you're not in all the sense, but specifically the, the idea that the wall is a continuing to be a wall. And yet it has interesting things going on in it. It doesn't uh, go out of its way to do what this would do. You know, this wouldn't be a good mural. Although that people do murals with this kind of depth, but they then go around and cut out the outlines really strikingly. Uh, Michelangelo might be an example of that, though. I'm just thinking it in my head at this moment. So now, but this is to show you again, when we start, when I start with Gamel, this is Gamel. <laughs> Paxton is the same thing. Um, it, the outline-based model is, is, now when I say that, he's a mix in his approach, but, he's, but his end result is to, to wind up with that other look. 
you know, which is what I'm trying to say is to wind up his, you know, the um, Vermeer, the Vermeer was very much his, his, his example. <clears throat> uh, and I do mean that sort of linear look. So, but this is Paxson and Gamel and Gamel's training, of course. So this is a down from this to this, to, to me doing a study in a, in a uh, classroom. So at least you've seen that, but again, you should be able to see in this one, even though there are areas that are lost, that this is base. You can see the entire structure of this thing is, is outline based. It's, uh, and it's, again, sometimes the subject is what really should be orienting that for you. If you're looking at a woman up in the sky and you can barely make out her silhouettes, why would you go try to draw things you can barely see? Well, some people think you must, you know, because you must. Well, if there was a flatness thing, um, that might be one thing, but um, now, but this one, um, as soon as you do blobs, and this is where I'm agreeing with you completely, uh, Mr. Was it Kawas? <laughs> um, Mr. Kowaz, Kowaz, Kowaz. This one here, you could easily see just blotching around a few spots of, 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 of golden, golden whites and blues and then setting a couple reds in them, have a very clear idea really quickly what the composition is. And that is where I totally agree with you. That's, that is one thing that would be the, the, the benefit of mass, of putting things down as blobs. In this case, it could be a big brush. I mean, you could do it for a study, you could do it in a very small scale, but, but you might even start this one that way with these great masses, you know, trying to get out the great masses and find the composition before you settle in and do the finesse any of the drawing in all these busy little places, you know, that might be there and there and so on. Uh, and I'm just giving you the decamp on that, and that's Benson. So the decamp on the right is, is a wonderful example of him at his, at his uh, painterly best. But this again, it's different in its motives and its process by a little bit from Paxton. Um, you'll have to look at those two guys work side by side and see how I mean that and, and how, how true it is. But it is, in any case, it's definitely a version, a, 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 a bit of mass-oriented painting. It's not simply a thing about... Now, by the way, this isn't a big thing to say that guys aren't shirkers when it comes... who do the mass work aren't shirkers when it comes to the, to the drawing of the of the of the specificities of the contours, right? Nope, this guy is no slacker by any stretch. But his approach to it might have, and, and neither is, by the way, neither is Benson. When it comes to articulating the thing he needs, he's right there, he's all there, he's all in, and he's doing his very best work. And um, so don't ever confuse the lack of an outline with any kind of a rationale for, or, you know, a blob, the, the, a blob or mass approach with any kind of a rationale for, um, a bad drawing. It doesn't. It doesn't work out that way. Don't rationalize it. I I, I bring this because because Manet is like a. It was. It's wild to watch his evolution. But the difference between so there's Degas on the left and Manet on the right, and this Manet, Degas is a line guy. He comes backwards from line to mass. Except once in a while he blob something in like a Chinese draftsman. But he looks like he's primarily thinking, and he's got drawings for all these things. So he's already set things out in some sort of a line mode. And then he comes back and he winds up with our look, with the look of a mass painting. So he's got a, probably a mixed bag going on from the very beginning. But there's an orientation in his values, you know, he, what he values and what he, and his idea, of course, he's making an imaginative painting. If you have this woman sitting here in the park, it's another thing I've been saying. There are some efficiencies in the blob approach. You don't want to sit there and draw the outline of all the stuff in this picture for an hour or for five hours or whatever it might take. Whereas Degas, picture, Degas is putting pictures together from drawings and parts, and he's piecing them together like an imaginative painter. So, and, when you, and in that world, this is a little bit to me like the um, like uh, Sargent's um, El Jalejo in the way that it's has a relative lost and found um, broad uh, look, but it's still an imaginative piece together item. Just saying that you don't have, you're not stuck at outlines of objects and showing them all over the place. But Degas is notable for winding up with outlines that just stay and stay and stay, like he's valuing them or something. Or, and he's, you know, whereas the painter who's, the painterly painter 
will draw the cheek with this dark right here, and it's the cheek. You know, he doesn't have a line stuck in between them. And that's a significant difference between value of drawing. And uh, so this, this you could see in this uh, one by, by uh, Manet that there's a bit of what you would call that Japanese drawing there, that Chinese drawing. You know, you can see the spots are trying to be something. And, and I don't mean to be things, objects, as much as they're trying to be shapes, you know, the valid shapes. And then sometimes, you know, just suggestions of larger abstractions. This this is my classic side I'd like to talk about. It's a busy area. That's all it's supposed to be doing. It's a busy area. So he's not going to draw what's on that book. Doesn't mean he couldn't. But you see there's a difference in the motive of a, of a, of a you know, he's got some sort of a pleasure out of the, of the whole sort of snapshot moment there. And, uh, you know, there's a whole conversation with Gamble about, seeing what you, what can you see when you're flying by in a car <laughs> and there's something about that impressionistic impression you know and that but but the impression of the moment and the es essence of it and getting at the essence and so that's what leads Gamble to talk about that being a sketch model and so but is but is mass drawing always a sketch model not by any by any means but there's an approach to it where what it does, it looks like that, but it's not. A, there's no time at which it's a sketch model per se. Um, but these are nice examples, and I'll pull up a couple of my own here. This is Sargent on the left and Pleisner. Both these guys are watercolorists, and you can see by the by how much of some of these goats are drawn and what is drawn that he's painting by the mass. Sargent, very evidently painting by the mass, almost like a watercolorist, right? And that's why I say it pays when you're looking at Sargent to think about working from the lights instead of working from the darks. Because then you're drawing right into the lights and it's, you know, a, there's a watercolor technique involved, if you want to call it that. But, um, but this one here, I, I think is the painting. It's a very poor reproduction. For some reason, I can't seem to find a good one. And this is probably taken out of a book. Um, but uh, you can see the great washes that you, and this again, uh, Cow is this would be one of those places where you can see how, how quickly you could sort of blob that abstraction onto the canvas and show the great design of the picture. You're dead right about that usefulness of that. Yeah, you can't do that. You can, by the way, you can do that with scribbles too. You don't have to do it with mass and paint blobs and stuff. But there's nothing wrong with knowing when you can take and approach a painting from grander sweeping blobs and when you have to approach it from particulars. Uh, and the way I think of things is it's going to be a little bit of both at all times. So. But on the lower portion of this thing, I had a, um, oh, well, that's just watercolor. I was just trying to figure out some color schemes for a painting that you, I've shown you before with the goats, and, and I've shown you this before too, but, but trying to find a color scheme for this, um, for this um, uh, pa pastoral painting. There's a sort of a, a, a character in the background, it was Apollo at one point, uh, or a whatever with a lyre. And then this was a shepherd, a, a sheep, a shepherdess, and uh, some sheep. In any case, I um, I had I don't think I, I don't know if I used any drawing in that. I just did blob, minimal blob stuff, in the search for a color scheme. So, but that's clearly in some in sort of a pure sense. That's that's value work. Oh, so let me show let me show you these. Um, I hope this works, Mr. Producer. But this is a drawing I did out in Colorado, and I just recently found that Clyde uh, Aspivig has done did did the same spot, but. I only was out there with some students and or and was sketching. And so that you can see like on the post there, it's a single stroke with the brush. But I even think of mass drawing as what Monet does. That's that's not line drawing, in other words. So he's approaching the mass by bits, but he's trying to get to the grand mass. So that's so that's one. Um, and then some time ago in this area here, I um I I I did it again and I was out there and the right way to treat this tractor was by and so this is a field with a tractor in it. I hope I can show you this. And I can't put it there. I'd love to get it to stabilize a little bit because it's, hard, it's such a little picture. Or something. But maybe you can see, though, uh, that the marks on the tractor are all lost and found edges, a lot of blob. It's all based on mass. This entire picture is based on mass painting. And a significant part of painting outdoors just flat is. Uh, it's not drawing around objects. So... I hope people don't really think that that's ever what I would mean by by that. So when I do workshops with students, though, and we do go to the color part, I actually have you work, as you can see on the far right one there, 
like uh, Monet, and this is a pastel workshop, and uh, and gradually bring the drawing to places like this, right? So this, but this is a simply a an approach to getting the finish and the start, and it's not an attempt to get the whole canvas showing. Well, you are trying to get on the first day to get this done, you know. Now, this might have been two or three days, I don't know, but the idea is, for me is trying to show people how to get all the basic data early and often. And some combination of mass and line is going, I have found, is by far the most efficient way to do it. So, but these would all be fairly short-term studies with pastel, and they're not very big. I don't know what the biggest one is. You can probably see by that easel there, what, or the, by the, this thing here, how small they are. So that might be able to uh, help you get it across. But this one is the last one. I just thought of this. We used to use this one for a value study. So a big piece of what you're talking about, Kawa, is, is the um, idea of, of the um, painting in a valuistic way. And what we mean is the grand abstraction and what it's up to. So we call it the spotting. So if you can picture this for a second, the way I try to get people to think of this is, don't you see this is a big middle tone, darkish middle tone painting? And it's got a, it's got a sort of a, some darks that come out of nowhere here and just start trucking their way across, cluck, 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 and then gradually get a bit darker and darker as they go. And simultaneously, there's this power white right in the middle of the painting. And if you could knock that out there in just seconds with blobs if you're just trying to get at the essence of the gesture. And that's where I really do like what you were saying, that there is something about, you know, you need to get your head around that, the life of that. And so doing these little preliminaries, even if you're making a picture up in your head, come to a place where you look at your values that way and think, what's the spotting? What is the value game? What's it up to that's intriguing? And you can see Degas all the way there. There's so much entertainment in his, his little busy is trucking their way up and up and up and up, and, you know having a little bit of a buffer and come chuck, 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 chuck out of the picture and, uh, and, and, and with the darks and then, the, uh, and then this abstraction of lights, you know, this grand one here is a stronger one there and these other ones. But you can see this, this game of the whites. If you blur your eyes, you'll see these things easily. And all I'm looking for as a, you know, what I'm looking for, when I look at these pictures or when a viewer looks at these pictures without even knowing it, he's attracted because of the, the visual play. It's what we do. This is, the guy is such a, you know, this is a beautiful thing because of it, but he's such a, um, a, a musician. And I think this is the symphony. I mean, I, all these things working together and you can hear these harmonies and, and notes in and out of each other right through the entire field of painting. But yeah, if you're talking about using it, I'm totally agreeing with you, Calvin. If you're talking about using it as a, um, as a way of getting an idea initially of what you've got, and these things can be dinky. You don't have to do these things on any kind of scale. Whatever it is you're comfortable with, the big fat charcoal in your hand. I, use, I have people use brown paper, as you saw just there a second ago. There it is. Brown paper, sort of in the real middle value, and then using white and black. So you could see the same kind of operation in these things. You know, We set you up, in a, in a sense, almost in a, an imperative of three values. If it's going to be interesting, it's going to probably get at three values. And then, and then perhaps more, more different value games distributing throughout the painting. So I think that's I think that's the best place to leave it. I'm going to look at your question again. Uh, I find mass drawing a great way to capture composition rhythm as well, definitely, quickly. And I feel, but again, whether that's your painting approach or not, you can be more methodical and more thoughtful and more, and have worked out many things. You can do drawings and all sorts of stuff. You have to be stuck with that. Degas did drawings for his work, but you can see that he plainly used value spotting conceptually. He, he grasped the importance of that interplay as spots on a canvas, including color spots, not just value spots, but certainly value spots minimally, which is usually where you see that action that is, that is most important. You know, if you keep that idea of what's this, of, of, of having a canvas look good from across the room, you're very much in the world of, of that first wave of what composition even is. And there's like this ta-ta-ta-ta, there's this great moment there from across the room. And when you walk up to it, everything is reinforced. And you understand the interplay of all the parts based on that first grand intro. So, yeah, that's what I would say about it. So you just gave me an invitation to say it. I probably said it before. I think I have. And uh, I'm not inclined to go back and, you know, dig up old stuff. Although I may do it for one of you guys. Somebody asked me about... Um, 
they said I was obfuscating in something about drawing, and I, <laughs> I'm going to have to go look at my own video. I don't get on here to obfuscate. I get on here to make points uh, of the things that I found work, and you know, and and they'll give value to the painter uh, who's trying to, yeah, you know, obviously he's going to have some common threads, but he's trying to make something out of out of this rectangle, this famous rectangle that we have to work in. So yeah. Okay, guys, that's my job. That's that's the best I can do for the moment. Anybody wants to talk about any of these things that we've already talked about, don't feel like they're make sub points. I don't mind. It gives me, and I don't have to make half hour events out of them like this one, but why not? I'll do what it takes. All right. All right, very good. Um, um, thank you again. My three C's there. <laughs> and. Um, that is uh, Jimmy C, Benjamin C, and Adam C. Thank you again for your ongoing support. M very much. And for all of you who do that. Uh, keep on subscribing. Keep on sharing. It's much appreciated and it's very helpful. I am going to talk more very soon about uh, and probably get a fundraiser going for our, my building. It's up to about five feet of logs, you know, and it's three major studio size, uh, big studios. So we'll do more about that too. In the meantime... Uh, have a great week and uh, we'll see you in the next one.